de Valera's goal being realized. Adding recognition of a new nation in Europe on their party platform was simply out of the question. So his plan was soundly voted down by a vote of 31 to 17 before it even reached the floor. Instead, a much vaguer statement in support of Irish self-determination was adopted with no mention of independence. To outside observers, it was clear that this statement was not the one that de Valera had gone to San Francisco to see adopted. He had gone to both of America's major political parties uh, and their conventions, presenting himself as a head of state and had come away with no political gains to show for it. Instead of cultivating major allies within either of the parties, Eamon de Valera had misread the field and damaged his own credibility within the Irish American and American community at large. In the autumn of 1920 then, the nationalist movement in America was devolving into two antagonistic factions. This threw the Gaelic American newspaper into a frenzy of vindictiveness that appeared in weekly articles about split fermenters helping England and de Valera's deadly blow at Ireland, why the clan must be smashed and the split is de Valera's own. The Gaelic American's ultimate condemnation was that de Valera was an unfit leader because he was too much like Woodrow Wilson. Rank and file Irish Americans were not hesitant to criticize either. Dr. William Patrick Slattery, who was chairman of the Iowa Bond Certificate Drive, wrote complaining about the way in which the Irish leaders had divided the nationalist movement in the United States. The so-called Irish leaders that I have personally met and who were shooting off this hot air during the entire campaign, to my mind, could not successfully run a ward caucus. The dimensions of the public squabble finally provoked one bemused British Foreign Office clerk to comment altogether the American Irish have got two wars on hand, against England and against themselves. This was true. The Irish world insisted its readers abandon the organization and Coheland's Americans. So the Irish world was a newspaper out of um, Philadelphia run by McGarrity. Reports of political infighting were not perceived well back in Ireland, where they were in stark contrast to the life and death situation unfolding throughout the country as guerrilla warfare intensified. Further hostilities arose as the Irish Progressive League was expelled from associate membership of the Friends of Irish Freedom in July. All of these factors of disharmony and unrest combined to provide de Valera with the pretext he needed to submit a proposal to dramatically reform the organisational structure of the Friends of Irish Freedom in August of 1920. Now, you know, for an Irishman to suggest reforming an American organisation was of course met with resentment and anger and they had a meeting of the Friends of Irish Freedom National Council on September 17th. Yet again, de Valera and his envoy arrived unannounced and caused chaotic scenes to unfold. His proposals were castigated and rejected by the National Council, leading him to stage a walkout of the Friends of Irish Freedom. Harry Boland and a few of them said, get up and follow the Irish president, get up, and, you know, and nobody did. At the time, when cooler heads prevailed, you know, things worked out. So the following day, he announced his intentions to create a new organization to rival the Friends, and he would call it the American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic. On November 17th, he formally established this organization at the Raleigh Hotel in Washington, causing membership of the Friends to rapidly decline, as a steady stream of members did in fact defect to de Valera's new organization. Regular membership of the Friends fell from 100,000 in November 1920 to about 20,000 in mid-1921 while de Valera alleged there were upwards of 500,000 members in his new organization. Now, I'd say there was no way that there was 500 or five times more members you know, than the original membership. There can be no denying that the Friends of Irish Freedom never truly recovered from this dispute with Eamon de Valera. From the point of view of the Irish Americans, de Valera had diminished years of work in a matter of months by leaving the Friends deprived of their mass appeal, which in turn meant that they could no longer apply political pressure as a group on Congress or continue their propaganda campaign against anti-Irish sentiment throughout the country. And it's very important to like, kind of remind people, still in 1920, huge anti-Catholicism you know, that was going on. So he, particularly, you know, uh, Cole, and was a judge on the Supreme Court, and felt very strongly you know, that there was uh, a lot of anti-Catholic stuff that was happening, the KKK were rising, even in Buffalo, you know, we had issues with, against Jews and Catholics in Buffalo with the KKK. So there was a lot going on for Irish Americans that had nothing to do with Irish independence or, you know, the Irish at home. And so he really did kind of disturb that cohesive Irish American vote uh, that could have been kind of leveraged here in America. 
Now, the criticism of de Valera should not mask the fact that he was able to retain the loyalty of the mass of Irish Americans interested in the Irish question. If he was opposed by Bishop Michael Gallagher or Bishop William Turner, he was supported by Archbishop Patrick Hayes, who wrote, while promoting subscriptions to the Bond Certificate Drive, I am enclosing my personal contribution of $1,000 to the Irish Fund. After a very satisfactory conference with Mr. Eamon de Valera, President of the Irish Republic, I am convinced that his program for the agricultural, industrial, and commercial development of Ireland is entirely practical and constructive. Even a doubter like Charles McCarthy had to admit after meeting him that de Valera makes a very good appearance, and of course he has a very logical case. Pillars of support like Frank Walsh saw de Valera consistently doing well. In April of 1920, when the split was only beginning, Walsh wrote, President de Valera is growing in popular esteem every day. And even after the controversy became embarrassingly public, Walsh's comment was, de Valera is having his little troubles with American leaders who do not seem to vision big things, nor to clearly understand the mighty adventure in which your country is engaged. By August, Walsh was downplaying the so-called difficulty of the split, and he must have been one of the few people in the country who could say of the fiasco of the, of the conventions that de Valera's effort was really, after all, a splendid success. <laughs> people who had for years opposed the leadership of the Friends of Irish Freedom and Clan Gael, like Peter Golden and his wife, naturally stuck by de Valera in these difficulties. Of course we've known the split would come, wrote Mrs. Golden in February of 1920, and she later told her husband, we are all so horrified over the editorial in the Gaelic American, we can hardly think of anything else. Uh, Dr. William Maloney, who by 1920 had emerged as one of de Valera's major supporters in New York, was, quote, very much alarmed lest the gang knife de Valera over this statement in the Westminster Gazette, where he talked about the Cuba relationship. A friend of George Cohelan reported that he had attempted to win over Mrs. Mary McWhorter, who was the president of the Ladies Auxiliary of the AOH, but she worships de Valera, quote. Even such old Clan and Grail stalwarts as Joseph McCarthy broke with Devoy and rallied to de Valera's support. The American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic was able to become a force in Irish-American affairs throughout 1921, and both the Irish world and the Irish press remained sources of media support. So the Irish world, you know, we said was in opposition to the Gaelic-American. Uh, so despite the split, de Valera was never without friends and supporters in the United States. Congressman Basil Manley concluded in July 1921, after Lloyd George opened talks, Remember, De Valera went to London for a few days um, to try to, you know, hatch out the talks first when it was a, a ceasefire. De Valera is certainly handling the negotiations in magnificent style. And it seems to me that unless something unforeseen happens, the only result will be to put England in a terrible hole. Of course, nothing came of those talks. Um, Senator Thomas Walsh, who had followed closely but had never been conspicuously active in Irish affairs, commented optimistically, I am hoping that through the statesmanlike efforts of President de Valera and his able associates, a solution of their troubles, which have in recent years weighed so heavily upon the people of Ireland and been attended with so many miseries to them, is at hand. The solution, of course, was the anglo irish Treaty of December 1921 and the creation of the Irish Free State. And, of course, de Valera was not present for those uh, negotiations. And what happened to the money? In the aftermath of the Irish Civil War, a dispute arose regarding the money raised in America. De Valera claimed the funds on behalf of his political party, which remained dedicated, he said, to complete independence. The Free State Government, under now President William Cosgrave, claimed the funds on its behalf. It had, of course, been set up for the Irish Government, as existed out in 1919. While the Irish High Court remitted half the funds to the Irish Government, the other half remained on deposit in New York because simply it had never been transferred over. In 1927, the New York Supreme Court ruled for neither Cosgrave or de Valera, ordering instead that the balance of the funds should be returned to the original subscribers, all of these individuals who gave $10. Files obtained from the Irish Press newspaper in 2004 indicate instead that most of the funds were diverted to create that publication, controlled and substantially owned by Eamon de Valera. De Valera circumvented the ruling in New York by asking subscribers to endorse the forthcoming checks and send them to him, or to legally assign the bonds to him, which would have had the same effect. He asked them to do this for the purpose of establishing a newspaper which would counteract the prevailing journalist, uh, journalistic ethos in Ireland, which De Valera wrote to them is, quote, consistently pro-British and imperialistic in its outlook. So very many subscribers did as he asked. And so these people received shares in the Irish Press Limited, a shares drive which was underway in Ireland at the time, 
uh, with 200,000 shares in the new company being issued at one dollar each or one pound each. So he's doing a second fundraiser like in Ireland. Um, but many others received shares in the Irish Press Corporation, which was an American entity registered in Delaware. Uh, there was a documentary shown on Tina G, I think, at home, uh, that showed us how little is still known about the Irish Press Corporation, which does exist, and its connection with the Irish Press Publishers in Ireland, and of course that paper is now defunct. It suggested that de Valera had managed to take control of the American entity, you know, kind of personally, and that its voting bloc in the Irish newspaper company um, sold for a paltry sum to him. So de Valera left the United States in December 1920 with mixed results. Though he had raised millions of dollars through the bond sale, he had made little progress in co-opting official America to Ireland's cause. Much as division was to characterize the next chapter of his own political career in Ireland, de Valera's sojourn in America was also to leave Irish America more divided than it had ever been. Um, his visit, of course, did not achieve what he or Sinn Féin intended. The Irish American movement was split and actually practically defunct after his visit. Tension may have been inevitable, uh, you know, because of who the personalities were, so, um, I mean, here in America. And the split might have happened anyway, maybe, with the Friends of Irish Freedom. But there is no telling what may have been achieved had both Irish and Irish American factions worked harmoniously throughout this period. The potential of Irish American power uh, was recognized, perhaps most poignantly, by the British ambassador to the United States, Auckland Geddes, who commented how the Republican Convention incident of 1920 perfectly encapsulated the influence that the Irish could potentially exert on American politics if they could only proceed wisely. Um, and of course, what it does too has probably lasting effects on Irish America because that voting bloc and that kind of you know, leverage that they would have had as a united front against um, other policies was totally lost. On his return to Ireland, de Valera keenly felt his absence from the War of Independence. So here he is with Harry Boland, who remains kind of his, you know, number one. He was with him in America. And there's Michael Collins. Um, and of course, they split. Harry Boland and de Valera are on the other side during the Civil War. He seems to have been quite resentful of the control and power which Michael Collins held uh, particularly over the Irish Republican Army. Collins controlled the IRB and directed operations in the guerrilla war, even though Cahill Brewer was Minister for Defence, and so ostensibly should have commanded the army. Collins was Minister for Finance, and had been deeply involved in the funds raised in America through the bond, none of which were forthcoming. So, um, de Valera's stay in America, I think, encouraged him to try to end maybe the power that Collins had in a strange way, this is the Irish press, um, and so you know he begins to urge almost immediately on his return that they should stop this guerrilla warfare, you know, where, don't forget there's only 3,000 guns in the whole IRA, um, and they should make a kind of a grand statement, one-off kind of a, an attack like they did in 1916, which it ended after seven days. Uh, and so they do attack the four courts and things, you know, it's a, basically a disaster. But they are able to, through uh, you know, all of this intimidation that had been going on and the bad press that the Black and Tans were getting, they were able to force uh, uh, the UK to kind of a stalemate or a, certainly a truce in the summer of 1921. And then we said de Valera went to England, talks didn't come off well, he comes home, and that December he sends uh, Griffith and Collins, who did not want to go, as the pleading potentiaries to discuss the treaty. So he learned, I would say, a lot politically in America. You know, he certainly learned a little bit about backroom dealing. Um, he, you know, he himself, I don't know how involved he was in the actual fighting of the Civil War. You know, I, I, it's hard to know. Like he certainly, the film implies that he ordered, you know, the execution of Michael Collins. It doesn't look like he had that kind of control, to be honest. You know, it, there was a certain faction within the old IRA that were going to do whatever they did. But, you know, de Valera went around the country making speeches about we would have to bade, wade through the blood of Irish men, you know, before we would get out of this. So, um, he seems to have learned something about pacing himself, and of course he knows he's sitting on a fortune, you know, at least two and a half million sitting in America that only he has access to. So, that was de Valera's War of Independence. Spent in the lap of luxury in America. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I don't have strong opinions. <laughs> So does anyone have any questions? I'll just turn on the, the, the last light. And if there's questions or comments. 
can't hardly see you. <laughs> that noise is blinding me. Um, anyone? I, presumably, if I knew, sorry, I'm just, no, you're good. I'm just going to go to a darker <laughs> slide so I can see. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> um, this may just be because I don't really know much about the financial world in those days. And, mm -hmm may have been one of the reasons, or maybe not, that people thought it was illegal, but I just don't, like, and clearly it didn't really matter if De Valeria wasn't ultimately dispersing funds, but it seems weird to me that he could get away with advertising not only a country that didn't legally exist yet, mm -hmm. bonds in the name of a country that didn't legally exist yet, that wasn't America, but selling bonds and collecting money in American currency. Like, I know that back in those days, the dollar was pretty strong compared to other currencies and international business was conducted through it, regardless of country, not necessarily like today where everyone has their own, but mm -hmm. it just, I don't understand how that would have been useful. Obviously, maybe it was because they were keeping it here and maybe that was his plan all along and he figured this is how he's gonna do it from the yeah. start. But like, again, I know that the purchasing power- I don't power, think he knew to himself, to be honest, a lot of those ins and outs. You know, they. Their original plan was just to co-opt this, the Victory Fund. Right. Well, and it was sort of, Mag or not McGarrity, Cohen's plan too, like that we'll just keep going with this thing, raising money in America from Americans, you know, to be used at our discretion. Right. Which would be, we will give you a check. <laughs> but because he couldn't control how much you would be getting, yeah. this did not suit him. So, uh, like, I read somewhere that it was, you know, kind of Collins's idea to come mm -hmm. up with the bond, which I, we had a picture. Right. Um, I think you did have, and that's the thing, it looks had, a lot like a, a saving, like a, even today, like what you'd see as a U.S. Exactly. savings bond. Like. So, you know, and apparently between uh, Mara, who was this accountant that came out from Ireland, and uh -huh. FDR, they were able to word it in such a way that implied you know, you know this is a risk, the thing mightn't exist, and if it doesn't exist, we're keeping your money, and okay. if it does, you can request, but like, you know, they're mixing gift and loan. Right, and, yeah, because you know, so usually you can which, redeem a bond at some point yeah, too for your own. Yeah, so I think that like, that was <laughs> suggested that you could redeem it. Even but, though you um, probably couldn't. <laughs> but you probably couldn't, like, so you know, the purpose is to, well, I can't even read that, raise the recognition, I think, of the Republic. Yeah. You know, and then, it's an American commission, you know, Got so it. it probably is an American company, the elected Congress of the Irish. I mean, they're very funny with their... Uh... It just seems interesting that you could, I mean, obviously technology wasn't what it is now, but it was like newspapers yeah. and stuff were pretty well circulated and it just seemed interesting that you could get away with saying, like, yeah. essentially look like the government of the U.S. is endorsing this when it's not officially... No, and it was the <laughs> government of Ireland who was endorsing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, like, the American government wasn't involved. But it, so it was, the, like, the free state government, which is not what they were calling themselves at the time, you know, but, like, the, the Irish Republican government, when we gain recognition, mm -hmm. we recognize that you gave us this money and we will pay it back if you want to be paid back. Like, yeah. basically, it's what it is. Right, yeah. And I can't remember, like, you know, the SEC isn't really being regulated. Right, it's, yeah, it's yeah. It's very loosey-goosey. Yeah, know, at for sure. Time. So you obviously they did it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Kind of based on I know in World War One the Americans sold war bonds. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. Liberty bonds. Right. Like, yeah. Because I, I have little cards at home that my dad and his brothers had in school, and they would bring like five cents a week, and they yeah. get a stamp, and then at the end they would have a war bond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. it's basically a loan that they raised from Irish American donations you know, to a, to the Irish government, mm -hmm. which, as Abby said, didn't exist. So it's just amazing that this thing that didn't exist was able to raise money. But, you know, I, I think how they kind of got away with it was because the money wasn't being sent back. You Makes know, sense, yeah. Was kind of detrimental. Like, yeah. imagine if they had been getting the money, what Michael Collins could have right, wanted. Yeah. Or if they were, you know, like, and that was one of the things, too. Devoy just wanted to buy guns and ammunition and ship right. that over. Like, he, you know, nobody needed money in Ireland. Yeah. They wanted, Stuff, well, they wanted yeah. food, but they wanted guns, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it would have been... Like the victory drive was probably a better way to go in one sense, you know. Um, well, especially for De Valera, since he ultimately stayed here for so long and yeah. helped give him an income, so to speak. Yeah, um, well, that's it. I mean, they spent <laughs> tens of thousands, you know, yeah. literally, ten, yeah. probably millions, like on his hotels exactly. and trains and. You know, well, they stayed the dinners. Astoria, yeah. and he yeah. couldn't, like, stay yeah. some other... Do we know? know? When he came, he looked like a homeless person when he got off the boat. Like, McGarity, yeah. he, he went to Philadelphia almost immediately, and McGarity took him shopping. And th there's a very good, I don't know if it still is available, it's on the Irish, you know, the Gaelic channel. Oh, yeah. TV. And I think it's called Devalier in America, and they were saying, 
you know, he took him to get tailor-made suits and new luggage, like his he, his bag, you know, was kind of falling apart. So he'd monogrammed luggage. Oh, wow. And McGarrity said to him, like, you know, you you were not a peasant, like you're the president of the Irish Republic. Right. So it was him even that came up with the title. They didn't really know, you know, what to call him. And uh, so, he, like, when he arrives in New York, then in his glory, it's because of the, you know, the Irish American faction realized that like, we need to present this guy as a president. And so, you know, part of me thinks, would the British Prime Minister have stayed in a friend's apartment, you know? Right, like, yeah. yeah uh, uh, I mean, I would rather he stayed in a friend's apartment. But it looked good, maybe, that he could receive people in the world. Definitely. You know? yeah. Do we know if anyone ever tried to redeem their, their bond at some point? Do we, well, I don't know I that think, we would. Yeah, I think people did. Like, or, like, who they would go to? I mean, that, that whole Irish press um, kerfuffle, you know, only came to light in 2004. Right, yeah. Like, but it, and so the decision was made at 27. I do think some people did. At least attempted. <laughs> yeah, but, and I mean, you wonder about the 20,000. Right. Like, I would probably come looking for my 20, particularly when it depends on what side you were on. Like, if you were a free state, so right, you yeah. don't want to have getting it, you know. So mm -hmm. it, I'm not 100% sure what happened there, you know, or how many of them even kind of had followed the news to know right. that there was no Irish Republic or where the money was at, you know. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing, well, but I'm sure the poor $10 subscribers. Well, definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah. just so close to the depression at some point, if you're looking for yeah. cash that you technically have, but yeah. don't really, and yeah. you know, everything else is going so so horribly. I wonder if well, anyone ever they, thought. You know, I, I read one article about it, and they said even with that, you know, he did retain most of the money. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> were any of those funds drawn down that were put aside for the press, or were those? Oh, yeah. He So he establishes the paper. Yeah. Uh, he gets almost all of them, and it, I like it was very complicated to be honest for me because I'm not financial. But he basically <laughs> issued a, an A share and a B share, mm -hmm. and one of them was like a sort of a lie, and it gave him control, and the other one was the other. And apparently, they kept enough sort of spare ones that if anyone in America complained that they wanted their money back, he, he would give them shares again. in the company. Oh, wow. But like to this day, there was a huge like expose done. You know, it still is sort of uh, now it's defunct but like the money is still there yeah right there. yeah and so like there's one shareholders meeting a year it's a closed meeting nobody's at all the way oh, wow. and everyone who has shares is part of the posse you know so it, it's an interesting cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah we should do one for a year yeah right <laughs> <laughs> don't be listening fence <laughs> but yeah like it, it's an interesting you know and i mean it's amazing to me how I suppose this is where I'm coming from, you know, the Irish thing. This was something that was cast up all the time about De Valera, like, who killed Michael Collins? Where's the money? You know? Mm -hmm. And so you either, like, loved him or hated him. And if you loved him, it didn't matter. And, you know, somebody <laughs> else was responsible. And other people just could not get past, you know, these perceived kind of crimes, you know? Yeah. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, wasn't the amazing, though, the crowds? You know, and it's just, you know... It's phenomenal, I think, how many... I feel sad for Irish America in the whole thing, to be honest. You know, like, if you think about how important, like, as an ethnic group, it's it's actually kind of after this time that their own sort of influence and cohesiveness, you know, like, goes. Um, you know, they're, like, they do very well out of World War Two with the GI Bill and stuff, but there's not an Irish American identity, again, for an awful long time, you know, until kind of it becomes cool after roots, you know, to dig into your ethnicity and stuff. Mm. So it's interesting how long uh, or how broad a coalition that had been here in America and just decimated you know by this loss you know and uh, like a lot of them die off too Devoy was old you know maybe the civil war kind of impacts how Irish Americans feel about Ireland you know um, but it's it was interesting how massive and how well supported there was something like five million like AOH members you know throughout the country and they could just tap into uh, that figure might be wrong but like it was across the country, you know, and all of them sang from the one hymn sheet, you know, in the day. So it's very interesting. But uh, so thank you for coming out, guys. Thank you. I, I don't know our January lineup yet. We are having a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times, Malachi Brown, who's an Irish immigrant coming. It'll be Zoom. Um, I think we've decided on January 13th. We're not 100% sure yet. And I'll do one or two other things in January. But otherwise, you know, have a great Christmas and holiday. And we're, we'll be open. We're closed. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, you know, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Uh, I'll be gone. So we're over the weekend. So. <laughs> yeah. But I'll be back in January. And, uh, you know, thank you all for your support throughout the year and for coming out tonight, especially in, in this cold weather, my God. Okay. And, uh, you know, keep an eye. We'll do the newsletters, of course, on Facebook and stuff. So just keep an eye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas. Yes, you too.